We hardly pick up a magazine or a paper today without being warned against the horrible menace of junk food. Junk foods are those which please the palate and do nothing for the system. But they have been popular for a long time. There is probably no, no creature that enjoys sugar as much as an elephant. And lumps of sugar were a joy to the policeman's horse when I was a small boy. And it is still a tremendous attraction for hummingbirds. They do not seem to realize the menace of it all. Or perhaps it doesn't affect them in that way. But if we are of a philosophical mind, we realize that from the beginning of the human struggle for self-improvement, there has been emphasis upon the importance of appropriate nutrition, not of the body alone. The dietitians can take care of that if they'll ever decide what is the best diet. But there are other levels which have to be considered. Emotional nutrition is very important. And uh, the Platonists and Neoplatonists believed firmly that the mind had an appetite, that it had to be fed, and that minds that are not fed get sick, wither up, and sometimes actually die. The mind has to be fed, and it, food is, it must be appropriate to the needs of the instrument itself. The mind lives on ideas. It lives on various important discoveries. And it, has, it is provided for us in order that we may be able to solve problems, expand ideas, find various new outlets for creativity, and also to settle down to the gentle process of self-analysis for the redemption of our own natures. The mind is important. Some people do not believe in it at all. But most who are thoughtful realize that nature has never given us a faculty that we did not need. It is not the faculty but the use and abuse of it that become the major determining factors. Now what is the mind fed these days? Well, it is fed some news, which is more or less imaginary, and highly uh, commercialized, and under political supervision. It is fed a variety of entertainments, most of which are not very entertaining as far as I'm concerned. It has a, a wonderful opportunity to enjoy sports. Well, sports are enjoyable. Many people like them. So the bleachers are usually well filled. Then there are other activities. We have people who like good music, which is feeding not only the mind, but the emotions. But we must admit that the mind has a job. It cannot sit back and simply luxuriate. It is not something that we support for no good reason. The mind is here to help us to, th to do things that we think are worthwhile. Now, man is a few days in this world. If he lasts uh, 80, 90 years, he's done very well. But during this period of time, he has faculties to develop, experiences to accumulate and interpret, and new ideas to generate within himself. He has a job from the day he is born, because nature's primary intention is that he should leave this world a little better than he came into it. In order to make use of the faculties with which we are endowed, we have to consider the type of nutrition that we demand for them, and also realize that they are not here simply to be catered to. There are many lazy minds. 
that simply wish to do nothing, or as little as possible. Among these are the ones who spend a fortune to have other people do their thinking for them. Well, that is just about as profitable as trying to find someone else to digest our dinner for us. It is only what we do for ourselves that becomes important. We are at the present time paying vast sums to people who are doing jobs we should be doing for ourselves. But we are not willing to learn how, and if we do know and become a little more financially adequate, we will not even know, use the knowledge we have. We will hire someone else to do it for us. Well, we cannot do any hiring on the level of the mind. It is true that we can listen and read and instruct ourselves on good literature. We can attend courses. We can study arts and sciences. These things we can do. But this is only the providing of the raw materials. These various assets are the shingles and the bricks and the cement. But each of us must build the house for himself. We have to take the knowledge that is circulating, assimilate it, understand it, and apply it to our own needs. If we would be more thoughtful in meeting our own needs, we would live a little longer at least and be happier while we're here. To waste mental energy is to deplete our resources and lower the standard of our essential living not simply our material and physical environment. How are we going to go about this problem of nourishing the mind? Well, we can assume for a moment that it's just like the body. And if we were trying to get the physical body into the best possible condition, what might we do? Well, the Greeks would tell us, and mostly also Oriental peoples, that the first thing you have to do to keep a body healthy is keep it clean. And that's the same with a mind. In order to have a healthy mind, we must have a clean mind. We have a, must have a mind that appreciates good things and naturally turns away from that which is defiling of its nature. So we have to clean out of the mind that which is likely to prove detrimental. We have to clean out of it things that are not worthy of the mind or of the human being who owns the mind. We have to keep our thinking upon a constructive, idealistic, and creative level. We must do the same thing that we do for the body, because the wrong type of mental material is smut, and that is something we cannot afford if we want a good mind. Now, the second thing that we have to do physically in order to have fair health is to develop a proper series of exercises. The body must be kept as alert and active as conditions permit. The same is true with the mind. The mind must be used, and it must be used well. To use the mind is to strengthen it. To abuse it is to destroy it. So the use of the mind means that actually we should think every day. We should learn something every day. And the incidents that occur to us should be given mental consideration. New experiences must be thought through. And if possible, old problems must have new solutions. The mind must be busy acquiring and using knowledge. If we do this, we are increasing its providence, we are in increasing its health. Then we come to the third problem, and that is feeding it. Now, the world in which we live is full of wonderful things. Every way we turn, we behold the wonders of nature and the achievements of human nature. We see the great arts and sciences that are flourishing around us. We behold architecture and psychology, medicine, law, all these fields of learning come to the attention of the mental eye. We see them intellectually, perhaps, rather than physically. 
we are surrounded by a universe of knowledge. And we have within ourselves an instrument to do something with that knowledge. We are not supposed to very carefully evade and avoid everything that might be of value or stimulation to us. In order to have the mind start out reasonably well, also, like the body and the person, a little education helps. And here it becomes a rather ticklish situation. Education is not generally very productive these days. Education does not help us, usually, to build a purposeful life. But one thing education can uh, give us is routine. It can give us organization. It can place small responsibilities upon us so that we have the lessons each day when we go to school. The purpose of education primarily is to order living and to cause the individual to accept with a certain amount of grace the fact that he has de demands upon him that he must meet. Having learned to discipline the mind, the individual then uses it for his own purposes. Doctor I know told me he took 11 years to get his medical degree. He graduated with honors. And after he graduated, he went to the School of Human Life, and there he learned all he ever knew. He did not learn his medicine in the university. He got his certificate there, but he learned it in practice. Now, the same is true with our mental activity in general. It is not the product of education. The professor who tells us what to think is making a great mistake, and we are great, uh, making a great mistake by letting him do it. What we want to know is how to think, how to discipline the mind, how to apply its instruments. Like a carpenter working with his tools, we want to know how to use the mind to improve the total life. With this thought basically in our consciousness, we then begin to ponder the wasting of time. We only have a certain number of years and also only have a certain part of those years suitable to mental activity. We cannot be as active mentally as we would like to be in an economic condition such as the one in which we live. We have to fight against worries and fears and anxieties and doubts. We have to be very careful that we do not end with a mass of prejudice that we can do nothing about. So we have to realize the importance of using mental time and mental energy for some reasonable purpose. Today, looking around us, we observe that one of the problems of humanity is that prosperity undermines thinking. The more we have, the more we want to enjoy, and the less we want to think. We are now trying to create a world which is a complete lifetime of vacation. We want to do only what we want to do all the time. Circumstances do not permit the full gratification of this impulse, but we try our best to escape every attitude or responsibility that interferes with having fun. Now, having fun for the average person mentally is the same as the junk food. Fun can be a contri contribution, but when we live for it alone and sacrifice everything for it, we soon find that it is not a substantial material. It does not nourish us adequately. Fun is important. There is no reason in the world why we should not enjoy living as much as possible. But fun that is completely devoid of intelligence and does nothing to nourish us or build anything into us should certainly be kept at a minimum. The real purpose of, the, of life is not just to have fun, but it is intended that we should help, help to build a world in which happiness is possible for all of us. But having fun and happiness may not be the same thing. But either one, happiness or fun, as the Arabian Nights tells us, must be earned. 
The individual must deserve happiness or he will never experience it. He will get all kinds of false glamours, but they will fall apart and leave him as miserable as he was before. The mind, looking around, has to try to find a balance for living. We find in educating the mind, for instance, that it doesn't flourish on a mono diet. That's been tried also. There are also people of various religious uh, aspirations who believe in extended fasts of the mind. In other words, don't think at all for long and extended time. Relax completely. Make the mind a blank. And in that way, overcome the tendency to worry about our own indolence. By not worrying about it, we think we dispose of it. It's the same thing with all forms of unfinished business. If we can get our minds off of them, we feel that it is a success. This is not a true fact, however. It is not that our minds should be worrying about them all the time, but that the minds should settle in quietly and solve worries as far as possible, so that they simply will not return. With a proper nutrition, we can achieve most of this end. Now, we have a whole world of possibilities to, atta to attack and work with. And each individual is a person in his own right. And there are, therefore, many different approaches to the proper use of the mind. The main point is that it should be used to build something. There are those to whom art or music are the most important things in the world. There are others who are completely involved in science. There are some that wish to improve memory and some who would like to forget what they still remember. There are all kinds of personality patterns. So each individual must come to some kind of a constructive conclusion in which he uses his mind to find out what is best for his mind to do. He has a right to use his mind to make decisions, but these decisions must also meet the requisites of his conscience and be suitable to his estate in life. Therefore, in the study of the mind's nutrition, we must decide what we want to do and then, then use the mind to help us to do it. The idea that the mind is a nuisance is a mistake. It is the misuse of it that is a nuisance. The mind is necessary to the fulfillment of nearly anything we want to accomplish, secular or religious. Now, there are many who want to use the mind for big problems. Such problems, for example, as answering the mystery of life itself. But the mind also, if we are intelligent, reminds us that there are things it cannot do. And the individual who uses the mind for purposes which the mind cannot fulfill, is making a mistake. Now, the minds of different persons are of varying degrees of development. Some can think a little further into the depth of things than others. But there is always a limitation. The mind cannot solve that which is superior to its own nature. Not being able to solve, it rationalizes. Now, the rationalizations of the mind are, are derived from various experiences of living. We try to understand the causes of things by studying their effects. We seek to keep faith with the universe by observing small areas in which we can understand the workings of the divine plan. We are constantly seeking to know more of the reason for ourselves. And the mind is one of the instruments that we must use. But the mind itself must be trained to recognize its own limitations. On the material plane of things in daily action, employments may involve mentality. Some of them are largely physical, but nearly all do require a certain amount of mental effort as a support and organizer of skills and abilities. Therefore, because we have to use the minds in the physical world to make the necessary adjustments to advance careers, so in our larger living, the living which involves our place in a divine plan of things, 
the mind must also be employed. It must be given every possible cooperation and help. Now, some minds have been spoiled by their owners, and a great many have been left comparatively undeveloped. When the mind becomes the servant of ambition, or the mind is, uh, develops within a person lacking moral integrities, the mind can lead to one disaster after another. And the mind can produce a criminal just as quickly as it can produce a saint. All depends upon the person in whom this mind is functioning. Now, most people do not really want to be evil. They do not want their mind to lead them into crime. They would far rather develop some useful outlet for their energies and for their ambitions. But there's still, there is still the danger that the mind will tempt the individual to an excess which is not good for him and is dangerous to his own future and happiness. So if day by day we work with this mind, leading it in one direction or another and it leading us in one direction or another. It is a very interesting and mysterious instrument, and most individuals take it, take it for granted. They don't question it. It never occurs to them to wonder how they think or why they think. It is something at hand to be used largely for the gratification of personal desires. This uh, particular problem, however, is aggravated when the mind itself is seduced by circumstances beyond its normal control. Today the world is suffering from a terrific headache. The mental processes of the individual have been so seriously distorted that it is now almost impossible to regain control of the creativity and positive thinking with which we associate the mental process. We are forced to admit that the mind has been subject to a kind of habit-forming psychic uh, drug. This drug is made up of all the things that are happening in the world that are contrary to common sense and integrity. We are fed constantly with negative materials which finally do take hold of the mental equipment. The reason they take hold is because the mind itself is not being led by the person in whom it exists. If the mind is not led, it will lead. And when it leads, it leads in terms of all the indoctrination it has received. The mind, therefore, can be a tyrant. It can also cause us to accept situations that we should not tolerate for a moment. Usually, of course, the poor functioning of the mind, with its disaster-prone qualities, is the result of the fact that the mental equipment itself has never been educated, never been trained, and never been disciplined. So if we are wandering around with uh, very forlorn attitudes, if we just feel that everything is wrong, the probabilities are that the mind has developed a toxic condition. It has become so nourished and fed and overfed by junk food that it is destroying our lives. Therefore, we have to clear it out and start over again. Most people find great trouble in starting over again on a new mental level. It means too much disrupting of the circumstances which have become part of the environment. The person no longer feels that he can start over again. But he can, to a measure, uh, begin the process of reclaiming his own mind from the slough of despond into which it has fallen. It can be done at home, it can be done anywhere and everywhere. But the first thing, probably, that the average person just living along from day to day, will find useful is to broaden the area of interests. The person who is interested in interesting things is beginning to gain control of his mental equipment. If he just wanders around waiting for someone to entertain him, waiting for something in the newspaper to frighten him, 
wait for some bad news which will justify what he always suspected. If this becomes the habit, the mind is being gradually deteriorated. Be, uh, to begin with, then, a little discipline. It's hard to go back to childhood. No one wants to go back to the time when they had to go around and say yes to all their elders, who, when they had all kinds of ideas of their own, which no one would let them express. We don't want to go back to a situation like that. But we have to begin sometimes with a new approach to a mind that may be a 10-year-old mind in a 50-year-old body. The mind that doesn't mature is the key to the real age of the individual. The physical body, of course, is subject to certain changes and uh, ramifications and modifications with years. But the actual age of the person is determined by the maturity of his emotions and the integrity of his thinking. When these remain adolescent, Age has no real meaning in terms of usefulness. And it is a really sad and tragic thing to imagine that persons can go from the cradle to the grave without growing. They can so adjust their lives to the fulfillment of creature comforts that nothing of importance occurs to them because they will not permit importance to be a part of their living. Most people think that importance means work. And if there's one labor we would like to escape, it is the labor of labor. We do not want it. But, and we come to the strange attitude that if it's good, it's unpleasant. All virtues are regarded as frustrations, just as all uh, obedience to dietetic laws regarding junk foods uh, all such obediences are regarded as frustrations. We are told to give up the things we like the best. And there are very few that really make it, unless they have some very special inducement. Young ladies, for instance, can go on a starvation diet almost indefinitely, for vanity's sake. But most people are not very vain about how their minds look. The body you can see, but you don't, don't know what's on the mind until the individual opens his mouth. And then he is exposing a situation which is really more disgraceful than overweight or underweight of body. To really get to work on a mental life means that the person must develop mental interests. Now, uh, today... Almost all interest in this life and in this world is vested in wealth. The individual uses his mind to scheme with. He uses it to find ways of outwitting his neighbor. He also uses it as a way of shoddying goods and uh, justifying sloppy work. The person today wants his intelligence to be directed toward the fulfillment of material ambition. Now, the mind can do a lot in that direction, but where the individual gets centered on this, there's another problem arises. The mind fails to tell him the facts of life because he is not listening to those. It's like the small boy who does not wish to listen to the experiences of his parents. The individual who is completely devoted to the fulfillment of his physical ambitions, who is going to be a senator even if he gets murdered afterwards, who is going to run for some public office simply because the salary is high, or having gotten that public office, spends various ways and means to find out how he can increase his salary. All these things are the focusing of the mind upon estates, upon swimming pools, upon campers, very long journeys, and of course an occasional trip to Las Vegas. These become the important things to work for, to work for every fulfillment possible, 
of physical comforts and desires. And yet the mind can tell us very quickly that it is all rather foolish. But even if the mind told us that, we don't believe it because we don't want to. To, to spend a lifetime accumulating all that we can get of something that we must leave behind when we leave is something wrong with the idea. If we could take our wealth with us into some other dimension of space, there'd be a little justification. But there's very little actual mental satisfaction in leaving behind you a fortune which will ruin the next three generations. You might have to live somewhere on a cloud and watch your descendants misuse everything that you have left behind. On many instances, it's all gone in a year anyway. And yet the person himself worked a lifetime to accumulate it. And having accumulated it, sacrificed the spending of it in order to leave it to someone who did not appreciate it. All of this is bad thinking. All of this ambition is, is mental junk food. And to live by it is to, li to die very, very poor. Now, philosophy tells us, and common sense supports it, that we're not going to be able to take these things with us. We also learn from our common sense and our doctor that while we are here, overtaxing ourselves, exhausting our resources, and worried to death about things we can do nothing about, we are destroying what little life we have left. We are using, or abusing, wasting vital resources that should have been applied to something more significant. Now this does not mean that we have to give up all hope of comforts or everything that is necessary to a decent living in this world. It is avarice, it is the overtaxing of our living and thinking. It's the gradual substitution of nothing but junk ideas for the processes of thought. So the time comes when we have to do something to change the pattern. You can consider it today in the present economic crisis, a crisis that results completely from a mistaken notion, namely that everybody on earth can be a millionaire at the same time. This would be a very beautiful thought but not possible. And if all the wealth of the world was divided equally among everyone in the world, there isn't a one person in the million that would be satisfied. We just are not that way. We are not built with that kind of thinking. So if we want to get rid of our social problems, if we want to get rid of the probabilities of war, if we don't want to continue to be exploited by everything, if we hope someday to be able to find people who will do a day's work honestly, if we want these better things to happen, then we have to realize that there is within ourselves a faculty that can help to make them happen. But if it is used entirely for some other purpose, and never gets down to the reason for its own existence, this faculty can continue to lead us astray for the next 10,000 years because it all arises inside of ourselves. Now, against this situation, then, we have to say to ourselves, if I was dieting physically, I would eat the food that is best for me, if I really wanted to. If I didn't want to, I'd diet for a little while, then go back on the old regime. But presuming we want to have a better way of life mentally, we can begin to cut down the excesses, strengthen moderations, and take a healthy, normal, reasonable attitude toward life. Now, we may be uh, overlooked a little by the more opulent if we do not join with them, but at the same time, it is far better for the person to have good health, a good home, happiness, a job that he likes, and all these things than it is to go into this desperate competitive effort to gain more than is proper or necessary. Now a lot of people today realize this, but they are finding another difficulty. 
that uh, has come along. We are coming into a generation of people in which mistakes have become the norm. The individuals themselves live in a world that is run by mistakes. And they find that it is very difficult to live in this world honestly without being heavily penalized. But that it was also true on the dietetic level. Everywhere we look, in television and everywhere where advertising exists, we see these luscious pastries, these wonderful cakes and cookies, these magnificent banquets, this distribution of highly specialized bottled goods, and everything you can think of. We're tempted every minute. And uh, this is true in our mental world. We are tempted every minute to think badly. All we have to do is turn on the tube and we will be given ample opportunity to wish we were not alive or to fear that we will not be alive much longer. Uh, we pick up a paperback and find that a lot of literature now is explaining why the world won't last another 20 years. So we are being conditioned constantly. We are being frightened to death by situations which actually, if we think for a little while, are not nearly as real as we insist on making them appear to be. We have to realize that to, in order to get away from the hypnosis of our time, we've got to begin to use the mind ourselves for our own purposes instead of being the victims of the misuses of the mind by other people. Fortunately, each individual in a wonderful way is a fortress unto himself. Each of us can live just about as well as we want to. We're going to have to sacrifice some things. If we want to be healthy physically, we've got to sacrifice a number of bad habits. If we want to be healthy emotionally, we have got to sacrifice a number of unfortunate and destructive emotional attitudes. If we want to be a truly intelligent human being, we must sacrifice attitudes and ideas and convictions and prejudices and opinions which are destroying our humanity and leaving us completely victim of the general problem of society. So, it's up to us whether we wish to do some of these things or whether we wish to drift along until the sod is placed over us. Now, if we decide that we're going to try to do something about it, then there is, incidentally, I have noticed, a way of doing some of these things that is quite interesting. For, for a long, long time, there have been people who have tried to do things better. These people we have called reformers, and for the most part, they are among the most unpleasant of our memories. Very few people want to be reformed, but they would love to reform other people. That's been taken for granted. But there have been experiments in society. There have been countries, there have been generations of people who tried to do it right. And for the most part, their efforts have been recognized and have been recorded. So one of the exercises of the mind of the average person is to investigate how average persons all over the world have thought and acted in order that they might live intelligently. There's been a great deal of that type of effort actually made. Now it is beginning to sneak into competition too. There are a few folks now that are beginning to realize that you cannot expect to live securely if you abuse the privileges of life that you enjoy. We are also beginning to realize that the individual who is not interested in what he's doing really doesn't deserve to be paid for it. We find out that Albert Hubbard was correct when he noted that the average individual in the United States in his day, which was quite a while ago, was earning $100 a day. But in most instances, a part of that, sometimes 90% of it, 
had to be paid to someone to watch the man do what he was supposed to do. So we were paying out of our own earnings whatever is necessary to keep us in line, to help us to do it right, or to guard us against the tendency to abuse the privileges that we have. If we want to try to solve this situation a little bit in our own living, we can very often do a great deal to straighten out the problems of life. One, for example, is a very important one, amusement. Now, we have to have some of it. The individual who no longer enjoys anything in life has not been using his mind well either. It is quite right and proper for persons to enjoy themselves within reason, within a proper distribution of their available funds. I think the uh, Oriental peoples have some figures. We don't want to go into names and places, but that at least in several Oriental countries, out of wage earnings, uh, savings will run up to 15 and 18 percent. That is, in those countries do not begin to have the financial level that we have, but they are able to save out of their earnings. This country with the largest earning and the highest salaries in the world is not able to save 5%, because the moment it comes in the front door, it is spent. It is spent on everything you can think of. At the present time, this spending is affecting the banking system. It is endangering the Federal Reserve System. It is creating continuous unemployment. It is vitally affecting the quietude of the mind of practically every citizen. So there comes the mind now. The mind has to settle down and serve the owner. It must tell him what he can spend safely and why he cannot spend something else safely. It will tell him why he, is, he should be wise to drive the car he has until it is paid for before he get, turns it in on another one. He may also learn that he can live a little longer without a houseboat, or that it is abs not absolutely necessary for him to spend the type of funds that are now being wasted in restaurants. There is no possible way in which an individual or even a family can eat the price of some of the meals that are being served today. And everybody goes out, why? Because it is glamorous. They love to go and spend four or five times what is necessary. As a result of this procedure, uh, the uh, bankruptcies of restaurants is increasing rapidly. And the bankruptcy of the individual is way ahead of it. We do not need these things. They are not the basis of happiness. They're not the basis of enjoyment. They do nothing to actually contribute to the well-being of anybody. And if our friends are only friends because of such inducements, they're no friends and never were. Gradually, we are going to have to come down from this exalted level of waste. And we can't do it unless the mind helps us. The mind has got to put us, put us on the necessary economic diet. The mind must lead us in the way that we must go. Now, one of the m most important forms of friendship that exists in the world is mental friendship. Individuals who know other interesting individuals, people who can get together and discuss interesting matters, who have hobbies and activities and, and problems that they find enjoyable, useful, and important. There should not always be somewhere in friendship a constructive, useful, creative factor. Friendship should mean something. It should not be based upon vanity. It should not be based upon trying to climb socially. And it should not be based upon extravagance. It should be based upon mutual interests. It should be based upon the opportunity of human beings with minds to settle down and have a pleasant evening discussing matters of common interest and importance. The mind has to be given an active work. Otherwise, it will just go to seed and there will be never be an interesting evening. 
With the interesting evening problem, there comes the matter of checking more deeply into our own subjective structure. Somewhere lurking in each individual is something he'd like to do. Usually he has blocked it because it costs too much. Or it is something that he could not get mutual support for from other members of his own family or the community. But each person has a potential of being interesting. A potential of trying to do something that would make life a little more valuable and useful. I have a friend who loves to use a 35 millimeter camera and travel about and taking pictures of interesting scenic sites such as Yosemite and Yellowstone and Bryce Canyon and the Grand Canyon, the Muir Woods, all these things he's very much interested in. And of course, having taken a great deal of, a great number of these pictures, he likes to show them to other people. Now, he found out a long time ago that if he was interested in taking pictures of himself, he would not have an audience very long. <laughs> he, did, he found that if he was standing in front of the great Sherman tree so that nobody could see the tree, that the uh, slide was not a favorite with the neighbors that every picture in which he devoted his attention entirely to photographing his own family against an illustrious background, the pictures would have been far better had he not inserted himself into nearly all of them. He caught on to the idea that people were much more interested in seeing the things that interested him than they were in looking at him. So he changed his tactics. He used an entirely different philosophy of, of photography. He was very careful to avoid being in the pictures or having his relatives in the pictures. He took one or two with the family on purpose, but the rest, for entertainment reasons, were allowed to feature the realities that he saw. And instantly, the pattern changed. He was a member of several groups, including a couple of luncheon clubs, and in the course of a few months, he was one of the most popular guests for club activities, church activities, and neighborhood activities. People loved the pictures. And he had gained a very enviable reputation by getting out of the film himself. It was a novelty for all concerned, and they came back and enjoyed it. Now, this is the type of experience we have to gradually learn to think things through and find out what will make it better. And nearly always we find it gets better to the degree that we are less obvious. The individual who is constantly trying to focus on himself seldom has many friends or can keep them, and is not popular. In order to really ga gain intelligent friendships, we must be doing interesting things. We cannot become a friend simply by existing. We must have some reason why other people want to know us better. And they want to know us better because we are doing interesting things. Now, in the older group of people, in the retirement group, we have exactly the same problem. After the uh, business world is through with us and has... Uh, gotten practically all there is of us anyway, uh, the problem then comes, what do we do? So the individual looks forward to retirement until it comes, and then he proceeds to slowly die of boredom. He suddenly discovers he has nothing in the world to live for. In other words, he was merely a person who was on a certain mono diet, his job. His job he used to fill a life, but no job can ever fill a life. Even the most useful and uh, constructive job cannot take the place of some thinking, some planning, some building for a personal future. So that uh, the mind is the one that we have to live with when we retire from the tensions and stress of business living. We have to live with our own thoughts. 
And when we start to live with our own thoughts, they ought to be important thoughts. They should bring us memories of things that were meaningful, things that we are glad to remember. When our thoughts only remind us of our misfortunes or remind us of the mistakes we have made, then it's probably too late to correct them, at, at least in this embodiment. The main problem is that to have a good mind to live with. When we do not have other things to live with, we must begin training it early. We must make it a valuable, useful, interesting mind. And in so doing, uh, we have a, a good chance, a good share of thinking with, with the future. I remember in London, in the officers' club, I spent several afternoons with Sir Francis' young husband, uh, the British officer who was a so-called conqueror of Tibet. As a conqueror of Tibet, he said to himself he wasn't much of a success, actually. He was, however, able to lead an expedition across the Himalayan mountains, do the glaciers and everything else, and occupy a country without the loss of a single man. This was considered rather an unusual achievement on a military foundation and got him a knighthood. But uh, actually, as an elderly man retired with a uh, frock coat that was a little green instead of black, it was sort of shine down, and with the kind of flea-bitten look of a, a man that was belonged in some British foreign agency, uh, Sir Francis, as he was well known and loved, uh, spent some very interesting hours with me. He was just full of interesting things to think about. He was full of places he had been. He was full of people he had met. He had full of ideas that he had seen. And among other things, he found out that having conquered Tibet, he thought he'd better study a little Tibetan philosophy. And for all intents and purposes, he became a Tibetan Buddhist. But anyway, he was having a wonderful time. There wasn't a dull moment in his life. Now, it's true that everyone can't lead an expedition into Tibet, even a small one and at the present time probably can't lead himself in. But there are other interesting things he can do. All down through life, there are interesting things. I remember my esteemed grandmother. She had more interesting things to talk about. She was able to describe and discuss things. Um, she was a social success to the day of her death. And yet she seldom, if ever, talked about herself. One thing she learned early in life was that nobody cared about her troubles. And very often, uh, people, you know, were trying to gossip with her. And she was about as difficult to gossip with as anything you ever saw. When a gossiping session was over, the visitor left having learned nothing. And grandmother knew their whole lives. <laughs> but I never heard her repeat a story to anyone else. She took it for granted that confidential information was confidential. And she didn't need it. Because when people came in, she had so many things to talk about that it was not necessary to fall back upon small talk. And the whole life of modern man is built largely on small talk. An individual spend the whole evening discussing the relative value of two tennis rackets. This goes on one way or another through life, until at the end we have managed to go through the years so perfectly insulated that we have practically never had a really important thought. Our thoughts have been too small for us, and they haven't taxed the mind or stretched it into new ways of thinking or living. So if we are in certain doubts, most people are, the individual who doesn't think a little nearly always is in considerable difficulty. The problem comes of how to, to make an interesting life. That is one of the jobs the mind is meant for. It is intended to help us to live from the cradle to the grave without one moment of boredom. And if we are bored all the time, there's something wrong with our own thinking. If we can only remember the miseries we've passed through, there's something wrong with our own thinking. 
if we can only remember the people who injured us. The same is true. Actually, the mind must be filled constantly with ideas which communicate to our personalities in a way that make life interesting. It can be done. But one way, of course, to do it is to start early by doing interesting things. It's not really easy to begin, to begin an interesting life in your 70s, but it is perfectly reasonable to start one when you're seven. Everything that happens in life can be interesting by fact or interpretation. Everything that happens is instruction, and it is also usually instruction rather gently delivered. It only gets more forcefully pressed upon us when we fail to notice the more gentle approach. We, we have to have these active purposes that have something to do with why we're here. Imagine for a moment, what is man, as asked the prophet, that God is mindful of him? What are we? Are we simply little bowling pins that are being knocked down by time? Are we just here to suffer a little while or try to make a living or argue with our neighbors or have broken homes? Is that life? Is that the thing we're supposed to be doing? Or are we supposed to be just driving around the countryside in traffic just because we're bored staying home? Are these the purposes of life? It is not conceivable that they are. Actually, we are given an equipment to make life not only important, but dynamically interesting. And there'll never be a moment when interesting things are not happening around us. The problem is, do we tune in on them? Or do we walk by them buried in our own remembrances of our misfortunes. To get started on a process of proper mental diet, the problem perhaps is summed up by one old scholar who said the best way to start to train the mind is to settle down to the regular pattern of having an original thought every day. One original thought something that we haven't taken directly from somebody else. Of course, the chances are that it won't be as original as we think it is, but it, at least it began with us as a personal thinking, a personal effort at mentation. To have a thought and carry it through to a constructive and useful termination can be tremendously important. One way of coming to this, of course, is your old Pythagorean theory of trying to figure out how much we would be worth when we leave here and go somewhere else. Supposing at the end of this life we depart into another region, another dimension of life, another place, another condition. We don't uh, wish to dogmatize as to what it's going to be, but I think nearly all thoughtful persons agree that there's, you know, there's something out there and that we are part of it. Now, as we go out through this gate into there, what are we taking with us? What have we learned that is interesting? If we make a little trip around the world or if we go to the south of France for two weeks, we come back and talk about it for a long while. But when we leave here, this world, what do we take with us? What kind of memories do we have? What have we learned by the experience of living here? What has living here meant to us? other than as a continual boredom and a paycheck. We have to take something with us that we didn't bring, or our life has been a complete failure. We brought with us a capacity to grow. If we don't use this capacity, we have failed. We brought with us minds capable of thinking. If we haven't thought, and our thoughts have not been worth remembering, then again, we have missed the reason for our own purpose here. We have come into the world with very few faults that are known, but with infinite capacity for good or bad according to the way we develop and maintain inclinations and attitudes. So we can assume that we came in comparatively innocent and hopelessly ignorant. And we do not want to leave comparatively vice-ridden 
and hopelessly ignorant. We want to have something to show for this life that means something beyond this life. Something that we cannot estimate in terms of an estate or a swimming pool. Something that has resulted in growth. There are many things that bring growth. And one of these things is association in life. What has family taught us? What have we learned from children or parents or marriage partners? What kind of a home life has developed within ourselves the capacity for friendship, affection, and a willingness to sacrifice for those we do love? Have we had this experience? And looking back, are we really glad we had it? Although at the moment it occurred, perhaps it was considered to be an interruption to a larger purpose. What have we learned day by day that we can take with us and which will result in us being bigger people? If we are not somewhat improved, then actually nature has wasted time. Nature has given us a body, a mind, a heart, a soul, and has vested the spirit of man in an appropriate vehicle. It has given us a beautiful world into which we live and which we continually attempt to destroy. It has given us infinite opportunity to learn, to know, to think, to wonder, to dream, to hope. And most people do very little with these things. Yet at the time when we leave here, we are only going to take with us what we have appreciated, understood, gained through association, what has enriched, matured, mellowed the inner consciousness with which we have been endowed. We have to take with us a new sense of value, a larger sense of honesty, a more justified integrity. We have to take with us a greater love of beauty, a greater respect for life, a greater insight into the infinite diversity of life. All these things are growth. We do not have to be in the world in order to appreciate the world. But if we have lived in it and take the appreciation with us, that lives with us long after the world has faded away. Everything continues to exist within ourselves if it has ennobled our own conduct and enriched our souls. So that, uh, there has to be this dimension. And we can pause at any day of my life and say, if at this moment I drop dead, what am I? What have I done to justify being alive? What have I done to accomplish the unfoldment of my own internal resources? Now, many people feel that it would have to be something very big in order to really justify uh, solid reflection. But that is not true at all. The big things of life remain in the universe. The small things are our peculiar duties. And if in the, at this moment, if we should be stricken, we can remember friendship, love, service, unselfishness, if we can realize that someone was grateful for something that we did, or that we were grateful for the privilege of being able to do something, that in some way we, are, we understand better, we love more deeply, we appreciate more sincerely, we forgive more quickly. All of these things are growth. And at any moment that we can look upon life and see these qualities and know that we have developed them within ourselves, at that moment, even if death comes, we shall have life everlasting. Because we live and breathe and perpetuate ourselves in the nobility of our own growth, getting to be more in terms of what we were intended to be, that we were intended to grow. We have faculties no other kingdom of nature possesses. We have an environment which we can mold into something better, and it all depends on what we take with us out of here. Now, most people who are interested in philosophy and things of that time have a suspicion that reincarnation is a very factual law. We are inclined to assume that it is the only possible answer to the riddle of life. The average person certainly is not good enough to go to heaven, 
and not bad enough to deserve to go to hell. Somewhere in the middle distance is where he's going to go, and it's probably right here. Now, supposing you go through life, and you go on and on and on to the end, and you depart from here, and you have managed to escape anything important in this life. You have learned nothing. You have not grown in anything. You have not learned to cherish the good. You have not learned to outgrow the evil. You have not learned kindness or thoughtfulness or anything of this kind. What will you come back as? Well, the very possibility is that you might come back as a dictator. And having never learned that peace means anything or that honesty is worth cultivating, or that there is anything to live for but the satisfaction of ambition, you can become a tyrant. You will come back a tyrant, and probably as a tyrant, die as one did in a bunker in Berlin. That was the end of a life that brought with it into this embodiment very little of refinement, of understanding, of insight, of kindness, affection, and dedication. So those who go out of here without having accomplished much will have to come back with a small accomplishment and try to do a little better. And this may go on for many lives. It will go on perhaps as long as the petroleum lasts. But whatever it is, nature is going to wear out our selfishness if we don't do something about it ourselves. It is going to bring us back again miserable, frustrated, unhappy. It's going to bring us poor relationships and a bad career, as it did in the past, unless we do something about it. Therefore, the proper mental and emotional diet is essential to the long-range pattern of our own purposes. If we do not want to come back to a world that's a battlefield, we don't want to leave it as a, an embittered and embattled person. We have to gradually, through the period of time, let the growth of things that are important gradually take place within us. We have to, one by one, overcome the narrow, selfish thoughts that have kept us in trouble all through this life. Now, if we have to look forward not only uh, to the rest of this embodiment being uh, more or less disturbed and destroyed by our own conduct, and we may very likely face a future of more embodiments of same caliber unless we do something about it. We realize that nature has decreed in this universe that we are not going to get out of trouble until we stop getting into trouble. And we are not going to have a vicarious atonement we are going to have to pay our debts. We are going to have to learn what living means. And that the real purpose of living is to grow in a friendly, gentle, and Christian-like manner. And in order to have this realization, uh, we, we use the mind. Now, to say the mind is no use to us, of course, is a mistake. It is of great use to us. But it can be so contaminated that it is no longer capable of functioning. Actually, we notice, uh, and have noticed, as Margaret Mead did, uh, the integrity of the uncivilized. Native tribes in the heart of Africa or in some island of the South Pacific have integrities and they have codes and they have systems of honor. And they do not violate these things. And they have lived pretty good lives until exploiters from other cultures come in and take over. Then all these integrities gradually fade away. The same was true of the aboriginal people of this continent. Back practically all of your American Indian tribes had codes of integrity uh, that were lived and dedicated to the tribal good. The Indian learned from infancy that his first obligation was to his tribe. It was his duty to protect the society to which he belonged. Personal ambition was nothing 
in comparison to the need of perpetuating the common good. Anyone who does not perpetuate the common good is like the man sitting on the branch of a tree and cutting off the branch between himself and the tree. The American and the Iroquois League, the American Iroquois Indian tribal concept was very simple. You live to protect the weak. You live to God the truth. You live to work for the good of the, of the group. And if necessary, you live to die for the group. Personal selfishness would have destroyed every tribe before it was large enough to have a teepee. It was only because of complete unity that these tribal peoples wandering about on the great continent of America in old times lived their lives, gained their arts and sciences, and became part of the old way of life which the Indian still cherishes in memory. The Indian Chief Seattle gave his country to the people who had taken over. The white people had taken his land. And he reminded them that they had taken sacred ground, that they had taken a land that had been loved and served and guarded for hundreds of years by his people and that their spirits still guard the mountains and the forests and the rivers and the lakes, and that he is turning over to the white people a beautiful land unspoiled and unruined, a land where peace and security were possible, a land which was truly a garden, a garden that these Indians had guarded for years, for generations. So the old chief, when he heard, turned it over, said, Treat it right. Do right by it. Do not destroy that which is the great gift of the great spirit. How many of us today are really mindful of this? Yet this old Indian had more thinking in his head than most of the successful pe people we know. This old Indian knew that each of us is given a life and a world in which to grow and that we serve that world to make it beautiful. And when we take a wilderness and make it into a garden, then truly we are living according to the will of heaven. So it is our problem to start in and use the faculties and facilities at our disposal to gradually civilize ourselves and realize that what we call civilization today is a confused and uh, unredeemed barbarism. We are not civilized. We are not capable of fulfilling the first need of civilization, which is civility. We are not gallant. We are not kindly. We are not thoughtful. But the mind is the thing that makes the difference. The moment we decide to use the mind instead of abuse it, the arts will flourish. Music will begin again to dominate our world. Our books will be better written. Our programs will be inspiring. Everything we know will be better when we think through and also when we help to make it better by refusing to compromise our own principles simply because others do. We can say it's all right, the other fella can eat the cream puff, but if it's junk food for us, we won't eat it. And the kind of things we are getting in the form of so-called education, news, uh, commentation, industry, is almost all of it heavily involved in junk. Therefore, the time is for the person to reduce his needs to that which is essential, to use his faculties for the unfoldment and evolution of his own consciousness, dedicate his life to the common service of something more important than gratification. Doing these things, we make an important life. And as we realize that life is not merely 70 or 80 to 90 years, but life is forever. 
that we are going to go on living and we are going to go on living with the consequences of our own conduct. And if we do not improve ourselves, the next time there will be again the same troubles, the same insecurities, the same delinquencies, because we have not corrected them. Man is an evolving creature. An evolution for man is a gradual regeneration a rectification of conduct. We are here to be a little better every single day. We are here to outgrow all limitation. We are here to outgrow ignorance and superstition. We are here to realize that we live in a universe where there is nothing to fear except our own ignorance. When we gradually get around to some of these ideas, which may sound as though they are a little overworked at the moment, we will gradually learn that out of a tremendous effort we can make a little progress. Out of gradually changing some of our ways we will discover that with every important change in our own conduct a new world opens to us. The moment we become better the world becomes better. The moment we understand more misunderstandings become less. And as we understand more and more of life, we will understand more and more of God. We will understand the universe as a great benevolent area of opportunity. We will realize that we live in a sphere of infinite opportunity. And it's the same world that we call infinite responsibility. But opportunity properly accepted and used is a joy, not a burden. The individual who does it right is happier than the individual who escapes doing it at all. So uh, we get this junk out of our minds and out of our emotions. We will begin to see the wonderful things that can happen. We will begin to understand people better. We will understand religions better. We will realize that competition is not part of the universal plan. Competition may exist where intelligence is inadequate to accomplish survival. But if we use the inward resources of ourselves, competition is completely unnecessary. And out of, a, in, un, out of an unfolding and enriching cooperation, we can all build together for the security of man and the glory of God. These things we have to think about. And if we do think about them, we will work together to solve them. And each person can begin to use his mind for the purpose it was intended. The mind was given to us by the infinite in order that we might become aware of the infinite plan. The sooner that we realize this, the better off we'll be. This is how we can change a superficial, unprofitable, disappointing existence into something that is truly a glory unto the heavens. Actually, each individual is a divine spark that can blaze forth with the light of the infinite. And it's only by gradually disciplining and rectifying ourselves that the divine in us can be released for the service of all that lives. And there is in all of us a divine principle. And when this awakens in us, as in other forms of life in nature, we will suddenly discover that the divinity in our own collectivity becomes a heaven. For heaven is the place in which we live forever in the presence of God. And we do that right here when we live forever in the presence of the divine in ourselves and in those around us. There is a job that needs doing. There is a challenge that is greater than any competitive challenge. There is an achievement greater than any conquest that we can possibly have on a material level. So altogether, discipline is a proper nutrition for us. We must take in the proper nutrition of understanding and realizing our own place in the plan of things. And by properly nourishing the mind with great thoughts, noble incentives, through the study of great works, through the understanding of the scriptural revelations of mankind, 
and from the labors of the folk farmer, the artist, the artisan, the carpenter, all uniting effort for the glory of eternal truth, we can then discover the real reason for our existence. And it will be very timely for us to discover it this time, instead of waiting for some unborn incarnation to catch up with the things we should be doing today. So let's get on the right mental diet as soon as we can and uh, find that it is actually the most happy and desirable of all levels of nutrition. A good mental life is the source of greater happiness than we can find in almost any other direction. Uh, that's the way it looks. Thank you very much. <laughs>